Nice to see you all again. I'm Nir Manusi. This is going to be our weekly Soul of the Parsha class. Although, tonight, we're not going to talk so much about the Parsha. A little bit. <coughs> we're going to talk about the very special day that begins now for Hasidim, which is the 18th day of Elul. 18th day of Elul called Chai Elul, the lively day, the day that's alive, that's most alive in Elul. And it celebrates the birthday of two very major figures in Hasidut. The first is the founder of Hasidut, the Baal Shem Tov. And the second is the founder of Chabad Hasidut. Two generations later, the spiritual grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, student of his student, uh, Rabbi Shnor Zalman of Ladi, who founded Chabad. So these two, 47 years apart, the Hashem Tov was born in the Gregorian year, it's 1698, and the Alter Rebbe, that's how we call him in Chabad, the first Rebbe, the old Rebbe of Chabad, was born in 1745, 47 years apart, still during the lifetime of the first one, but they barely met. And they were born on the very same day, and it's a very important and holy day. So we want to, uh, we want to focus on the first one, on the Baal Shem Tov. We want to tell a little bit about who he was, and then we want to tell a story, a particular story that he told. And sort of from there on, we're going to dive into an idea that I find very deep and compelling and very fundamental to what Hasidut is all about. In many ways, today is the birthday of Hasidut, not just the birthday of the Baal Shem Tov, because the Baal Shem Tov, his figure, the stories about him, his character, the type of person he was, all these are extremely cardinal, they're very, they're a, an indispensable or an inseparable part of what this whole chidush, this whole vision of what Hasidut is, it has to do with his personality. So um, we'll start by a few small things that are usually said around him being born and coming into this world. So just a little bit about him. So he was born, as I said, just at the end of the 17th century, and he became orphaned very early on. And uh, his mother died when he was very young, and, he's, and both his parents died before he was five. And when his father passed away, he was there, and he told them uh, two things that were engraved in his heart and left an amazing and incredible impression upon him. He told him, you should love every other Jew as you love yourself unconditionally, and you should not be afraid of anything in the world other than God. The only thing you have to fear is God, which of course is not the regular kind of fear. We're not talking the fear of the dark or fear of, of criminals. It's a different, deeper kind of awe. So but that's the only fear you should really have. So, and if you have that fear, you shouldn't fear anything else. So it's love and fear. These are the two things that the father of the Baal Shem Tov left him. And so he grew up as an orphan, and then he was adopted by a group of hidden tzaddikim, tzaddikim that were righteous men that nobody thought knew that they were righteous men. They thought they were just regular people. Every generation has 36 hidden tzaddikim. And they, they found him, and they raised him, and they taught him, and he became a very a great scholar, but did, people didn't know this. They thought he was someone very simple. And he found a job taking the children to the Talmud Torah, to their school. He would just take them, take them for like a school, the old school bus. He would take, go to their houses and pick them up and, and, and accompany them to their school. And he used to put his hand on their chest and say, you should always be a warm Jew. He loved light and he loved warmth wherever he came. He added another candle. If there was no candle, he lit a candle. If there was a candle, he lit another candle. He wanted to add light everywhere, and he wanted to add warmth everywhere. So he put his hand on the chest of the children. He would say, be a warm Jew. And one of, the great, one of those students who later became one of the greatest uh, uh, rabbis of Hasidut, he said, my chest still burns from the touch of the Baal Shem Tov when he touched me when I was young. So, and... And then when he was 26 years old, on his birthday, same day, 18th day of Elul, 
the soul of Achia Shiloni, the prophet from biblical times, who was the same prophet to, to foresee the tearing apart of the, of the Jewish kingdom, of King Solomon's kingdom into two, he came to him and he started teaching him Kabbalah, the secrets of the Torah. For 10 years, the Baal Shem Tov would go to a cave in the Carpathian Mountains and would study Kabbalah with Achia Shiloni. Exactly 10 years between the age, between the birthday of 26, his 26th birthday, and his 36th birthday. And then on that day, again, Chayalul, Achia Shiloni told him, now you have to stop being a hidden tzaddik, you have to be a revealed tzaddik, your light has to be revealed to the world, you have to go out to the world. And then he was active for 26 more years. So he passed away when he was 62. It's all very beautiful numbers. He has 26 years as a hidden tzaddik, and then 10 years of studying, and then 26 more years of teaching, and until he passed away. And we're going to talk about something that happened in the middle of those 26 years. Of course, 26 is a very important number, because 26 is the numerical value of God's name. So his life is made up of, of two 26 years with 10 in between, corresponding to the 10 sefirot. And so it's, it's something very beautiful of all these, the way his life is structured. But we're going to say something small about the day that he was born. We, we, we rushed to talking about things that happened later. But about the day that he was born, there are two important Hasidic ideas that are said that are very meaningful to really teach, telling us, reminding us what Hasidur is all about. So the first one is that it is said that before the Baal Shem Tov came to the world, the world, and, and when, when the term world is used, it's, it has two meanings. One meaning is the world, the entire world, and the other meaning, the more narrow meaning, is the Jewish people. It's a bit like in French, when you want to say all people, you say tout le monde. It's all the world. You, see, you don't mean the world, you mean the people. So it can, refer, it can refer really to the Jewish people or to the entire, all of humanity, or maybe even on a wider circle, all, everything, everything in the world. So all the world was in a state of fainting. The world had fainted, so to speak. Fainting means you're unconscious, you're the world is bearing down on you. So if we're talking about the Jewish people, we can say that they were in a state of being fainted or, f or having fainted because of the diaspora. The diaspora was so long, so many years of being poor and not having independence and not having, uh, being far away from the Holy Land and far away from the holiness of the temple. And this diaspora was, was continuing for so long then the Jewish people were, so to speak, they, they've all fainted. If we do, we're not talking about all of humanity or all of culture, we can talk about the Middle Ages, maybe. The Middle Ages, where it was just before the awakening of modernity, and, and it's also a kind of fainting. And if we're talking about the world, maybe it's something more mystical. And so the idea goes that if someone is, has fainted, there is a remedy, there is a way, a method of waking them up. And the way to wake them up is to whisper in their ear their name, is to tell them what their name is. And this is interesting because we know this when we are in a crowded place and there's a lot of noise. And, and then we think we don't, we think we're not listening because it's just a jumble of all kinds of voices. But when someone says our name, it suddenly wakes up our attention and we, we, we turn our head and and we want to see where the voice was coming from. And this means we have been listening all along. We just weren't aware of the fact that we were listening. We were a, a bit unconscious or a bit like someone who fainted. We weren't aware. We thought, it's a bit like there's a verse in Song of Songs, I am asleep, but my heart is awake. So even when we are awake, but we, we, there's this jumble of no, noises or voices around us, we're asleep at that moment, but our heart is awake. Our heart is awake waiting to hear something that touches on the essence of our soul. And when someone utters our name, it touches the essence of our soul. And then we realize our heart has been awake all the time and has been waiting to hear something that touches us. So the idea goes that 
the Jewish people, or again, we can widen this, but the, the simple meaning is the Jewish people were in a state of faint, fainting. And the, the, you wake up someone who fainted by whispering their name in their ear, and then their attention sparks because it touches who they really are. And so the, 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 the people of Israel needed to hear the name Israel being said to them in a way that would reverberate and would touch the, the, the inner cores of their heart. And so the idea is that this is the Baal Shem Tov. His name was Israel. His name is Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov. That's his full name. His first name is Israel. And the idea is that him coming into this world, him being born, him, his soul coming, it's like God whispering the name Israel, touching upon the Jewish people, touching upon the heart of the world, the heart of humanity embodied in the people of Israel. And so this is something there. Of course, it, it, this again, this is a reminder of what Hasidut is all about. Hasidut is about reminding ourselves of who we really are and what we really want to do in the world below, beneath and, you know, both above and below everything else, all the, all the distractions and all the things that um, make us forget what it is that we really, really want to do in this world, which is to be connected to our soul to our inner essence. So that's something very simple, very beautiful that's said about his being born, again, on this day, 18th day of Elul. Second thing that he said is that, is that as, as I said, 18 in, in Hebrew is, creates the word chai, which means alive. So it's the, the, the day in Elul that's alive. Waking someone up is a bit like bringing him back to life. But another idea that was said is that Elul is the month of tshuva the month of repentance, of returning to God. Now, classically, traditionally, thinking about returning to God is, uh, when you think about repentance, it ha- it's something that's not very joyful. It has to do with hitting our chest and reminding ourselves of our sins and, and constantly thinking about how what we did is wrong and we have to judge ourselves and so on. And the idea is that the Baal Shem Tov being born on the alive day of Elul, on the Chai day of Elul, is him bringing to life or adding livelihood, adding vitality to the work of Elul, which is the work of Tshuva, the work of repentance. He wanted to change repentance to make it something joyful, something happy. He, he took the word mitzvah, commandment, and he says mitzvah comes from the word, from the root, Siva, letzavot, which means to command. Commandments comes from the word to command. But he says, yeah, but you can also read it in another way. You can read it as being connected or associated with the word tsevet, tsavta, which means uh, brotherhood, companionship, being together, bonding. All this is embodied in the word tsavta. When Hashem is giving us a commandment on the outside, this is something fearful and this is something that he's above us far away and he's commanding us and we have to obey and then we we have to judge ourselves for not obeying and so on. But but on the inside, this is an invitation to connect to him. He wants to bond with us. He wants to lift us up. Another thing he said was, we talk about the yoke of the commandments, taking upon ourselves the yoke of the commandments, the yoke of God's service. Yoke in Hebrew is ol. But all can also be read as has, has, is, is being connected to aliyah, to raising us up. So the yoke which bears down on us, according to the traditional view, according to the Baal Shem Tov, is lifting us up. So all this is just a few very small but basic ideas that everyone should, should be familiar with, uh, which talks about what it meant for the Baal Shem Tov to be born into this world. Um, now we want to tell a story that he told, something very significant that happened in his life. I said before that he was uh, 26 when he started learning Kabbalah, 36 when he started teaching his own particular take on Kabbalah, which is Hasidut. Hasidut is all about taking the mystical language of Kabbalah, which is very lofty, very high, very sophisticated, sometimes even very mathematical, and translating the mystical language of Kabbalah into a psychological language. That's really, in essence, what the Baal Shem Tov did. He was a Kabbalist, but he didn't want to turn 
his students into Kabbalists, because a Kabbalist is someone who goes up into the higher realms, and it's something very, very high, which not everyone can achieve. But he wanted to bring down the light of Kabbalah, the light of the inner dimension of the Torah, so that everyone could be connected to this. So he translated the mystical language of Kabbalah into a psychological language. Meaning, he took, for example, the ten sefirot, the ten divine emanations, and instead of primarily seeing them as divine forces, he saw them primarily as psychological forces, as forces or elements within the psyche. So, again, he was 36 when he started teaching his own particular vein of Kabbalah, which later came to be known as Hasidut. And, and we know that he would, he would die, he would pass away 26 years later at the age of 62. So he has, he has 26 days of activity. Now something incredible happened in the middle of those 26 years of activity. 13 years after starting teaching, th- starting to teach, 13 years before passing away, he had not on his birthday, but very close, uh, just a little bit before Rosh Hashanah, in the month of Elul, the same month, just, uh, just a little bit after his birthday, he had a, what is called, Aliyat Neshama. His soul came up, went up, all the way up to heaven. This, it wasn't the first time he did this. He would go up many times. He would close his eyes, and on the outside, he would seem as if he's like in a state of trance. But really what happened was that his soul started elevating, going upwards and upwards. But this time what happened is that it went further up than always. And we're not going to tell all the details, but the, 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 uh, the, uh, the thing we want to focus on is that at some point he reached the hall of Mashiach, the hall of the Messiah. And then he asked him a question. He says, this is unbelievable that I'm here, and, and we wanna, we'll, we'll say what the question was, and then what the answer was, and then we'll show that the inspiration for the question came from a Talmudic story. And we want to talk about the Talmudic story and compare the Talmudic story to what happened to the Baal Shem Tov. So the Baal Shem Tov went up to the higher realms until he found the, the soul of the Mashiach. And he asked him, This became a, a very popular song. Hasidim sing this song. I'm not going to sing because... I don't want to hurt your ears, um, but it's, it became a very popular song, very basic song, When are you coming? But he didn't say you, because it's impolite. He said, when is sir coming? When is your honor coming? Something like this. When is sir coming? And then the Mashiach told him, he quoted a verse from Proverbs, when your well springs burst forth, spring forth, and are, are, and go out to all the farthest reaches of the earth. When your well springs burst forth, and then he said even more than that, until everyone, all the people in the world, are able to see godliness in everything the way you see godliness in everything. When everyone is awake to the fact that God is present in everything and is present in their lives and everything that's happening is really just trying to hint or point our view, redirect our view, redirect our gaze, to remembering our truest so spiritual essence and why we came to this world, then I will come. Usually, is we think that Mashiach is going to bring about this change of consciousness. That first Mashiach will come, and then, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of God as the water covers the earth. Uh, as the water covers the sea, sorry. Uh, but here it's the opposite. He says, first there has to be a change of consciousness, and you have to bring about that change. It has to do with your fountains springing forth, and you've been working 13 years, now I'm giving you strength to work for 13 years more, and then I will come. And then the Baal Shem Tov really, was really actually weakened. He, 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 he almost fainted. 
when he heard this idea. He says, but it's going to take so long. But then he was given some piece of advice up there about how to shorten the process. Things to, he, he was given some basic Hasidic concepts that we're not going to go into today to help him. And it helped calm, the, calm him down a little bit. So this is the story that he tells in one of the only letters we have that he ever wrote. He wrote to his brother-in-law. And he told him this story. Now, where did the Baal Shem Tov get the idea to ask the Mashiach the question, when are you coming? So we can say it's a very straightforward question, the, the most basic question one could, one could ask if one meets the Mashiach. But it, it actually it comes from a very particular story. And the story is uh, in the Talmud, in the tractate called Sanhedrin. And the story tells, uh, tells us about one of the greatest sages, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, who had the same experience, but he got a different answer. So we're going to look at the, the two answers and compare them and see what happens when we sort of combine them. So the Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi one day came to the cave, right? Well, now we're, we're going away from the Baal Shem Tov now, and we're going back in time to the days of Chazal, the rabbis, and to the days of Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, and him meeting first Eliyahu the prophet, the prophet Elijah. So he went to the cave of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai. It's unclear if it's the cave where he hid or the cave where he's buried. But he, he came there. And then he meets Eliyahu Navi, the prophet Eliyah. And he asks him, when is Mashiach coming? Because Eliyah is supposed to come just before the Mashiach. So he asks him, when is Mashiach coming? So then Eliyahu tells him something very funny and surprising. He tells him, uh, why don't you ask him? I don't know, ask him. And uh, he says, okay, where can I find him? And then he tells him something incredible. And this is what we have to understand. He says, Mashiach is not here in the land of Israel. He, where is he? In Rome. He's in Rome. Rome is the capital of the Roman Empire, the a very negative place. The, the Jews suffered under the Roman Empire. And, uh, and they're the, the, maybe the, the, the place that embodies the uh, hiding of God's face more than anywhere else. Because it's a place in which humans are saying, we control the world. We run this world. And we want to create an empire that covers the entire world and everyone shall bow down before our idols. So what is the Mashiach doing there? So the Mashiach is sitting just bef before the gates of the city of Rome, but he's not inside the city, he's outside. He's where all the lepers are, all the people who are sick and ill. And he's one of them. He's also sick and ill, and he's, he's afflicted, and his body is filled with all these afflictions. This is said by the prophet, Isaiah, Mishayahu, that the, the, the Mashiach shall carry all the illnesses of, of everyone else. So he says, go there, and, and then how do you recognize him, you ask, says Eliyahu the prophet, because there are all the lepers there, there are all the sick people. How do you recognize the Mashiach? So then he tells him, everyone there is, they're all taking off their bandages and cleaning their wounds and putting on new bandages. That's what they do all day. But there's a big difference between, between the way they do it and the way the Mashiach does it, and that's how you can recognize him. The way they do it is they take away a bandage and they clean their wounds, and then they put on a new clean bandage, and then they go one by one. Sorry, no, no, I made a big mistake. I, I flipped it around, the opposite. They take off all their bandages, and then they clean their wounds, and then they put their bandages back on. But the Mashiach is the other way around. He takes off one bandage and cleans it and puts a new bandage and then moves on to the next bandage. It's less, uh, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to do this because it's far easier to take everything off and clean yourself and put new bandages on. But he does it one by one. And why, why does he do this? He does this because he is preparing himself, he wants to be ready for, the, for when he's called to come. 
by the way, we learned from this that even Mashiach himself doesn't exactly know when he's going to come. But he's waiting to hear a voice that would tell him, now, now is the time. So he needs to be prepared. So between one affliction, between taking care of one affliction and taking care of the other affliction, in the space between afflictions, this is when he may come. And so he takes them off one by one, so that if suddenly he's called upon from on high to come and save the world, he wouldn't have wasted any time. He would just come there. Of course, the other wounds would still be un- without new bandages, but it doesn't matter. He has to come the moment he's called. So he has to be constantly vigilant, constantly ready for the moment that he's called upon. So it's an amazing image, very, very deep image, especially when you think about this, that um, the word in Hebrew, nega, affliction, is nega. Nega is the root of touching. When you touch something, you feel it, it's concrete, you know what it is. Between one nega and another nega could also be understood as not just between one affliction and another affliction, taking off one band and putting on the next one, but between, it's in the space between the two things that are concrete. There's one concrete thing that you touch, and there's another concrete thing that you touch, and it has to do with being afflicted. That's what touches you. But there's a space between touching and touching, between affliction and affliction, that's that's where Mashiach comes. In the thing that's intangible, that in the space between something you understand and something that you also understand, there's a space of things that you don't really understand and you can't touch, that you know that you don't know. And that's when it comes. So this is a very, very amazing image. So then something also interesting happens. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi hears all this from the Eliyahu, the prophet, and then he sets off to Rome. But it doesn't tell that he actually left Rome. It says he went there. And it, it almost sounds as if he went there instantaneously, or sort of flew over from Eretz Israel, from the cave of Rabbi Shimon, all the way to Rome. It's very dreamlike, this story, something very dreamlike, that he, he one day, one moment, he's speaking with um, Eliyah the prophet, Eliyahu the prophet, the next moment he's in Rome, looking for the Mashiach among the lepers. And so he goes there, and it becomes even more clear on the other, the end of the story, that this is maybe happening instantaneously, maybe it isn't, it's not clear. So he goes there, and he finds the Mashiach. And he says, good day, my teacher and my rabbi. And, and he says to him, good day also to you, son of Levi. His name is Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, son of Levi. He says, shalom. And then he tells him, the question, the same question that the Baal Shem Tov many generations later would ask the Mashiach in his own encounter with the Mashiach, a very different encounter, also dreamlike, in the state of ele- elevation of the soul. So it was, again, the question was first asked by Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Eimatai ka'ate ima, when is, sir, when are you, the Mashiach, coming? But the answer was a different one. The answer of the Mashiach was, Today. Today, one word. I'm coming today. And then again, fast forward. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi is going, went back, all the way back to Eretz Israel. And he goes back to, to Eliyahu the prophet. And Eliyahu asks him, Nu, well, did you meet the Mashiach? What did he tell you? And then he says, first he greeted me, he told me, Good day, Bar Levi, son of Levi. And uh, Eliyahu told him, well, that's a wonderful. He gave you a great blessing and your father a great blessing and you're sure to, to have your world to come, your place in the world to come. But then Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says, yes, but afterwards he lied to me. The Mashiach, he's not a Mashiach, he's a liar. He lied to me and he says the word lie twice. Shakurei ka shakirbi. He lied a lie to me. What was the lie? He told me that he would come today, but he didn't come. He's not coming. 
So this even explained that it may have it may have been all the same day, and then the question is, so why uh, why maybe he, he'll still come later on today? But uh, but the way the Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi thinks about it is thinks that Eliyahu Navi has to come one day before, since Eliyahu Navi did not come the day before. That's why he thinks he's lying. So either at the day passed, he waited and waited, the sun set, it says Mashiach is a liar. Or maybe it was the same day, but it says it can't be today. Why is it a lie? Because Eliyahu didn't reveal himself the day before. Either way, he's very disappointed and he doesn't believe. He thinks, how do we call it in Hebrew, a false Messiah, false Mashiach. Mashiach Sheker. Mashiach, that it's a lie. It's all a lie. So he thinks it was a Mashiach Sheker. He's very angry at, the, at this Mashiach. He's very angry at Eliyahu Navi also. And then Eliyahu Navi tells him, no, no, you misunderstood him. He didn't lie. He would never lie. He says today, he meant, you should look, look up the verse in, in the book of Psalms. And the verse says, Hayom im bekolo tishmau. Today, if you shall heed his voice. If you shall heed God's voice, if all of us, all the Jewish people, and by extension all of humanity, if we all do tshuva, if we all do repentance, right, for the Baal Shem Tov, this is all happening in Elul, um, then, then I will come. Then the, then the Mashiach will come and God will be revealed and the redemption will happen. But you have to heed his voice. Heed his voice, right, it means listening to what Hashem is telling us and to what the prophets are telling us and so on. And so this is the end of the story of Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. So we have two stories. We have one very old one in the, in the Gemara with this, and they both have the same question. When are you coming? First answer is today. But it means today it's dependent. Today if you should hear heed my voice. But, uh, but sorry, but the the second answer, the answer given to the Baal Shem Tov, is not today. It has nothing to do with, with the dimension of time at all. It has to do with, well, it sounds like the future, but we'll see, it, may, it means maybe something else. When your wellsprings spring forth. So two answers, two stories, two encounters with the Mashiach. What does it mean that the first answer was today? And the second answer was, when your wellsprings burst forth. Before we go on, we'll, we have to say one thing. I told you that we have to connect this to the parasha. We, we call this class the soul of the parasha. Generally, when you look at the five books of Moses, when you look at Chamesh Chumshe Torah, and you look for the word today, Hayom, it appears many times, but half the times are in Chumash Devarim in the fifth book, in the book of Deuteronomy. Half the times that we're said today, far more than each of the other books. Why? Because most of the, the, the Deuteronomy is spoken by Moses on the final day or the final days of, of the 40-year journey in the desert, just before entering the land of Israel. So the, to, this is a very important, dramatic day. today you're entering the land of Israel. Today, you're hearing all the blessings and the curses. And today, and in this parsha, in particular, Nitzavim, we're reading two parshot this week, Nitzavim Vayech, shortest parashot, they read together this year. Nitzavim by most years, there, I think. It starts with, Atem Nitzavim Hayom, you, all of you in the plural, stand today. And the word today appears in this parsha, just Nitzavim, 13 times. And it's a very short parasha. So it's the highest concentration of today. And then in the Vayelech, the second parasha, also very short, three more times. So in this Shabbat, we're going to read the word today 16 times in the space of a very short parasha, sometimes twice in one verse. For example, the Torah, it was, is, this shlichu, this commandment to go into the land of Israel, is given today both to the people who are here today and to all the people who are not here today, who haven't been born yet. Everyone is present in this interest, this amazing today that is celebrated 
in this parasha. So how can we connect the first answer, which is today, but it's a conditional today, with the answer that the Baal Shem Tov got when your wellsprings burst forth? So we can say the following. We can say that whenever we try to deeply understand a, a moment in time, we have to translate this moment, we have to leave the dimension of time and talk about the dimension of soul. What do I mean by the dimension of soul? The Book of Formation tells us there are three kinds of dimensions. We know the three spatial dimensions and we know the, the temporal, time dimension. But the, the Book of Formation is talking about another dimension. A fifth dimension. So it talks about three dimensions of space, that's one kind, one dimension of time, and one dimension of soul. So the idea is that when we want to understand time in a deeper way, we have to translate the dimension of time to the dimension of soul. Meaning that, for example, the past in, inside of me still exists right now. The residues of the past, the fingerprints of the past, are present within me. It's not part of the past. It's, a, it's on the lower levels. It's my childhood, the child within me, the memories that I have, all these levels, these, these strata, levels within me, these are the past, present within me. And then the present is my conscious self making decisions right now, today. But then there's also the superconscious. The superconscious has to do with tomorrow. The superconscious is my future perfect self. My future perfect self is the highest levels of my soul, of my soul, the levels to which I'm not yet fully aware, that I'm not, uh, that they're not present within me in a conscious way. It's called my superconscious. My superconscious is my future self. And it's the future that exists right now, just like we say that the world to come isn't just somewhere in the future. The world to come is right now, it's the next, it's the next world up. And right now, if I'm thinking about contemplating my actions and sort of judging myself, this is, I'm, I'm in the world to come. I, it's, it's like judgment day, but it's right now. The future is with the future and the past are within me because that all of time all of the dimension of time can be translated to the dimension of soul. The past is embodied in the lower levels of my soul, the, let's call them the sub-rational levels, and then the present is present in the rational level, the conscious levels, and then the, the future is present in the super-rational, super-conscious levels that I'm not yet aware of. That's why it's my future. My past is all the residue and the impact of my past experiences. That's what psychologists like to deal with so much. They like to deal with, the, it's no coincidence that Freud was very much obsessed about everyone's past and very much obsessed with everyone's lowest urges. Because when you're going for the subconscious and you're going for the, what we call the animal soul, the animal soul is very much embedded in the past and the method in the animal levels. But if we're going for, then, then the, the student, uh, Freud is not all of psychology. Then some psychologists would want, want to talk about, they, they call them the humanists. They want to talk about the rational level, the, the conscious level, the level that's making decisions now that is able to make choices and, and change the world and change your, your life. So that talks about the present. But we want to talk about the, the highest level is the the future within me. Now, when the Mashiach told Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, I'm coming today, but Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi told, said he lied. He didn't come today. That's because they, they're talking about two different definitions of the world today. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi thought about today in the simple sense. Today as the present, not the future the rational level, the level that I can see, that I can understand, that's in front of my eyes. This is, the, this is today, right? Today is what's happening around me today. It's, it's something I can see and feel and appreciate and understand. 
But the Mashiach was speaking about a different kind of today, about a today that's really not what I see. We, we can say we can say this. With we talked about past, present, future. We can say that in each moment there is it touches upon the past, right? Because it's coming from the previous moment. It has its own existence. That's the present within the present, right? The the present in as much as it comes from the past, that's like the past within the present. And then we have the present itself. And then we have the present as it looks towards the future. So Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi was talking about the present, but the Mashiach was talking about the present as a, as a portal, as an opening to the future. Today, if you heed my words, so the choice, if you heed my voice or you don't heed my voice, that like, takes place in the regular today, in the rational, being in the moment, experiencing the moment, and choosing, do I want to go for, for the evil or for good? I want to go, for, I want to remember God, I want to forget God. I want to do what God is asking me or, I, or, not, or not. So this is the present. But it's, if you want to be really connected to when I'm coming, I'm coming from the future. I'm a future soul. I'm coming to you. I'm tra- uh, the Mashiach is a time traveler. It's coming from the future to the past. But we have to, to create a sort of opening for him, a, a, a portal. And the portal is in the present. And in the present, we need to, be, to choose to open up to this kind of future. So when the Mashiach is, said, I'm coming today, but it's, it's, a, it's not a today that you already have. It's a today that you don't have. It's between what you touch and what you don't touch. You can, you, right? It's, it's something that you, uh, you need to, it's, it's, it's a futuristic today. It's, it's the next today. It's not this today, it's the next today. It's, right? Tomorrow is going to be a new kind of today. It's the today that hasn't been named yet. I'm traveling from the future to the past in your direction, but you have to open up a door for me. So the Mashiach is really in this point of when the future is becoming the present. We should all think of our, we can think of our lives as growing from the past into the present. That's very nice. But if we want to think about our soul, about the messianic levels within us, we have to think in exactly the opposite direction. Our soul is traveling backwards from the future to the present. And we want to open a door for this future self to come in. And that's what the Mashiach was trying to tell you about Yoshua ben Levi. Fast forward to Baal Shem Tov. The Mashiach didn't say today. He said something else. And, and with these two answers really complement and give us an amazing view of what it means to connect to the messianic level within each of us. Because the Mashiach isn't just some uh, figure that one day is going to save us all, each one of us has to connect to, each one of us contains a spark of Mashiach. So that's what we should do with these stories. So the, 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 the answer the Baal Shem Tov got was when your fountains spring forth or burst forth. And we can also say this is talking about the same place in the soul. This portal, this point that connects my rational to my super-rational, my conscious to my super-conscious, this door, this portal, is like a fountain. That's exactly what a fountain, what is a fountain? A, a natural fountain is a, a very small opening that connects all the, the, the waters of the deep, the groundwater, massive amount of water that exists beneath the ground, and, and then it, it bursts forth into the, but it, it doesn't, it bursts forth at, as a, one droplet at a time, a droplet, then another droplet, and then a stream, and then a river, and then it goes all the way back to the sea and back to the groundwater. But it's this, this opening, the, this, like I spoke about opening a door, it's like opening a fountain. Our future self, that's like the groundwater, the waters of the abyss, the waters of the deep. That's our future self. It's a massive reservoir of potential, of spiritual water. And we need to open a door for this to come into our, into our conscious self. And this is what the Baal Shem Tov... So the idea is that this door is today. It's, your, it's, it's 
it's the, the connecting point between the today of the present and the today of the future, the today of tomorrow. We have to decide now in the, in the present that we want to be our perfect, positive future selves and not our past selves. That's the choice we have at each and every moment. Do we, do we open ourselves to the today that the Mashiach is talking about, which is really tomorrow? And when we do that, we're opening up a fountain and the reservoir of our future selves can pour into our present self. So this is, in many ways, what Hasidur is all about. Hasidur is about, Hasidur is an understanding of the Torah, it's a new reading of the Torah, it's a new reading of all the, 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 the written Torah and the oral Torah and the stories of the Talmud and the mitzvot and the, and the halachot, the particular laws. But ultimately, what Hasidur is all about, that's what the Mashiach was given as a mission in the middle, in the middle point of his career, as we said. He was given this mission, you should awaken each and every soul to their potential, to the spiritual potential. They connect to this point within them and open this fountain and let this fountain burst forth. And, the, and, the, and we, we connect this to the answer of Rabbi, that the Mashiach gave to Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, we, have, we suddenly have this idea that this reservoir of deep water that wants to spring forth and then go all the way off out into the world is coming from our future self. It's our future self is trying to communicate with us and trying to tell us and teach us. And this is what Hasidur is all about, learning class after class, book after book, song after song, Ferbrengen after Ferbrengen, to listen to this future grander, higher messianic self that is begging us uh, to open the door, right? It's like Kol Dodi Dofek, the, the, the voice of my lover is banging on the door, knocking on the door, asking me, begging me to open the door for him. Our future self is begging us to open the door that he would come in and make tomorrow today. This is what we get out of combining these two stories. So this was my, uh, my soul of the parasha class for, for this week. Uh, not so much about the parasha, a little bit. We can now read this Shabbat, read these two parashot, Nitzavim Vayelech, and think about all the todays that are uh, scattered throughout the, this parashot. And, and in each today, we should think, also another thing that is mentioned in this, one of these two days is I give to you today the, the, uh, the blessing and the curse and the good and the bad and the life and death. And I'm urging you, all this is God is speaking, to choose life. This is in this parsha. This choice between the bad and the good is also the choice between the past, the past, and the future. Do you want to live as a victim of your past, as a product of your past, or do you want to be your future self? And this is, means being alive. This is chayelul uvacharta b'chayim. Choose life. Choose your future self. Think about who you. What would my future self think about this and that decision? My, and my future self is, of course, the best self I have because obviously I'm not going to be bad in the future, right? That's how you should think optimistically. So this is, my future self is my tzaddik, is my messianic, my positive, highest self. What people today call, you're the best version of yourself. So the best version of yourself is your future perfect self. And you want to ask, who, who is that person? This is the Mashiach. And when are you coming? And, and the answer echoes back, it's up to you. If you listen to my voice, the voice of your future self, and you let it come in, then you'll become me, and I'll become you, and tomorrow will become today, and, and, and this, this will be our, a small redemption, our donation to redemption. So this is it for, for this week, and may you all have a great week, and a great Shabbat. 
Hi, if you enjoyed this video, please press like and subscribe to the channel. Also, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Patreon is a platform for supporting independent creators. You can find the link in the description below. Thank you very much.